man, I, I feel like I look weird without the mustache now. Uh, and whatever this insane haircut is. Do you, do you guys ever go into like your, uh, you know, the guy who's gonna cut your hair, and you're like, wow, you have a really cool haircut. Can you give me your haircut? And then he does, and it doesn't look like it looked on him. Um, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So, <laughs> howdy, gang. Thanks for coming out in the morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, I realize it's early, particularly for me, coming from the West Coast. But not too early, I think, for a little bit of astrophysics, right? Yes, all right. Let, so, normally my presentations are available on the web. This one is brand spanking new. It is not yet uploaded, thanks to some sketchy hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, but the conductor folks will be making it available. So, do you guys ever have that? That sense, right? You, you go out into the wilderness, not in New York City, obviously, but you go out in the wilderness and you stare up at the night sky and you're like, I, that's a lot of stars. It's weird that we seem to be so alone. In fact, it, it almost doesn't, doesn't make sense. And you could be forgiven for thinking this, actually, because it turns out you're, you're totally right. So there's, this is weird. Very weird. So ma mathematical odds that the Earth is the only life-bearing uh, body in the galaxy are pretty, pretty low. Pretty low, right? So we're talking about, in the Milky Way, we're talking about uh, between two and 400 billion unique stars. A billion is a phenomenally big number. That's a thousand million. A billion is so many, it's impossible to describe, and there's two to 400 billion stars. There's actually more than 100 billion planets, we estimate now. That number will probably go up. And about 11 billion of those are, are what they think are kind of in the habitable zone. They're Earth-like enough, and they are orbiting Sun-like enough stars to be potential places. 11 billion, so there's what? There's about uh, 600 of us maybe in the room today, so. Um, yeah, 20-odd 20, 20 million for each of us. That's, that's an insane amount of potential. And this is, this is weird, too. Stick with me. I promise it's going somewhere. I'm not just going to Neil deGrasse Tyson you all morning. Like, I want to. I really I want to, but I'm not going to. So 13 and a half billion years ago, right, the, the Big Bang happens. And then about, uh, I think, maybe 5 billion or so years after that, we, we get to a point where stars and planets and all that kind of stuff are, are like stable enough uh, to potentially start doing the kinds of things that Earth did. And, and Earth, you know, Earth started maybe another, what, uh, three and a half billion years after that, but lots and lots of the planets in the Milky Way started around this time. So that, that's, a, that's a ton of time, like an insane amount of time, right? That, that, if you think to yourself, well, maybe life could form on other planets, or, or uh, potentially, very potentially, right, meteors and comets can carry things like those little tardigrade water bears or whatever between planets and systems, well, then that makes for a lot of life-bearing candidates. A lot. And there's only really two possibilities. Number one, we are actually alone totally alone in the Milky Way. Among hundreds of billions of stars, there's just us. Or, whoever else is out there, we can't perceive them for some reason, and they've decided to ignore us. Or, evolution has decided that they will ignore us. For some, who knows? It, this is the weird part. So let, let's say that, uh, you know, Maybe 500 years from now, would it be reasonable to expect that there are uh, human beings who are living, surviving, and doing things on at least maybe Mars and the moon? Seems reasonable-ish. And maybe a couple thousand years from now, there's a few more planets, and 3,500 years from now, right? This, this kind of grows pretty fast. And that we, uh, we might think to ourselves, well, OK, that colonization process, right? That that this, these 3.75 million years to become what 
what astrophysicists call a, a type three civilization. This, this doesn't actually take very long on the galactic scale, right? So here's, here's a 3.75 million years. That's like a dot. This, this is actually overrepresenting. It would be like a, a shred of a pixel right here on our uh, cosmic timeline. It just doesn't add up. Like, it's just, it's too weird. If there's any civilization that, that ever existed in the Milky Way in the last 13 billion years, more likely 8 billion, right? But, and their wave emissions lasted long enough, because wave emissions, right, like TV signals that we send out, that stuff can be picked up. We, we'd find some way to perceive them today or, or very soon. So what, what scientists posit from this is Almost certainly there is something filtering out life that could colonize the galaxy. Something, some, something's filtering it out. And they, they call this the great filter, right? So there's, there's you know, the origin of a species, and then you get to type three civilization over here where you're getting over. And, and then there's all these commonly achieved evolutionary leaps. So you might imagine single-celled to multi-celled organism, multi-celled to sort of uh, uh, more advanced types of life forms, and then eventually intelligence, and somewhere in there is the great filter, that evolutionary leap that almost no civilization has passed yet. It's possible that human beings, all of us, are actually the, the first. That could be the case. It's also possible that we're extremely rare. Maybe it's just insanely rare for life to ever appear, and you need billions of years of the right chemicals bubbling on the right planets to get life. But there's also the possibility that we are fucked. <laughs> to, right? That, that lots of species have made it to where we've made it to, and that great filter is in front of us. I don't know what it might be, but It's kind of scary. This principle is called Fermi's paradox. It's named after uh, the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, um, died in the 50s. But he had this same idea, right? And he took, he took out all of these uh, ideas to their logical conclusion and went, something's, something's strange. There is this filter out there. And it, if you want to go spend some time, I would encourage you to, to read the Wait But Why article on, on the Fermi Paradox. It's totally fascinating and mind-blowing. It's one of my favorite things to reflect on. But this concept, this, this great filter concept, is a paradox that also exists in our world. In fact, it's one of the things that I think attracted me to the Fermi Paradox in the first place, is that we have a tremendous challenge in front of us. So it, this is true of startups, but this is true of uh, companies and campaigns. This is true of small businesses. This is actually becoming true of technology workers in general, that we, we don't even spend a couple years on average. Well, in Silicon Valley, right, uh, technology workers aren't even spending a couple years on average at a, at a position. And the web is kind of equally huge, right? 200 million active websites, uh, one to 10, million, uh, 10 in a million of those will actually be vis visited by the vast majority of us. And this sort of trickles down into all the kinds of work that we do. A vast, vast ecosystem of search results where most everything is invisible, right? Of those 33.9 million results, you'll see four. I'm going to take a brief aside. So, Will, did you guys all see Will's talk yesterday? Will Reynolds' talk yesterday? I had a bow. He did a. God, that was good. That was so good, Will. Very impressive. Uh, but I have a bone to pick with him. I, Will says, like, throw out the click through rate curves. I don't like them. I actually really like click through rate curves. I don't like them for the same reasons Will doesn't. I don't like them in terms of use this to calculate exactly how much traffic you're going to get. But I love them from the perspective of looking at how searcher behavior, on average, is changing over time. And one of the things that's fascinating to me about uh, recent click-through rate curves versus the ones that were put out four years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 
is that the click-through rate curve is flattening. Do you guys remember, like, 10 years ago in SEO, what did position one get on average? Like 60% of clicks, right? And now, 33, 32, 31, so it's gone, it's gone way down. And actually, that has bolstered positions two through 10. Uh, unfortunately, second and third page still get pretty similar to what they used to get. I, I'm also fascinated that the uh, mobile devices, you're actually more likely to click on some of those lower results. I think that's just because scrolling on a mobile phone is so, uh, it's something we're so accustomed to. Still very hard to get clicks. Very, very hard to stand out. I, all, almost all of us on the planet, I don't mean all of us in this room, all of us in this room, obviously, but almost all of us on the planet who have a web connection are using social networking. Have you guys read that in Hong Kong, where the, right, the Chinese government has sort of shut down the web so that you can't uh, uh, tweet things and you can't uh, share? They've actually created mesh networks. So there's an app you can download on your phone that will create a mesh network through Bluetooth to other phones and build a little internet across Hong Kong that can't be shut down because it's too distributed so that people can share what's going on with the protests. Pretty insane and amazing. And standing out at the... So this... This quantity of content that I am now consuming every day, that we are all consuming every day, that I don't have kids, but that our children are consuming uh, 10 times as much as we are, this quantity of content is absolutely overwhelming. Almost impossible to stand out because what do we do? We just scan, 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 skim, skim. Oh, Eva looks adorable. That's pretty much social networking. In fact, the, uh, the average brand, brand engagement rate, I, I went and found some data from Forrester. Uh, remember how I said Eva looked adorable in the photo, which she does, that Instagram, the highest of all, <laughs> because, you know, it's pictures. Uh, after that, it, it drops pretty far, pretty fast. That's a little, little depressing. This makes me feel way better about my like, oh man, I only got two and a half percent engagement on that tweet. Now I'm like, yes, two and a half percent engagement. Four people care what I think. Uh, <laughs> email. Email's insane, too. There's actually 100 times as many non-spam email messages sent every day as there are Facebook messages and posts. There's, <laughs> there's almost enough email sent every day for every one of the stars in our galaxy. No wonder you have email overload. Like, you get home from work and you're like, oh, god. Don't show me my inbox. Or worse, back from vacation. And click-through rates, they're actually they're closer to Instagram than they are to the engagement rates on like a Twitter and a Facebook, which I think why, is why email is such a, a powerful channel, but still tiny. This is MailChimp, by the way, who makes this data available for free. They make the average data, benchmark data, available for free, which I think is a, a phenomenal resource. And then when it comes to advertising, you guys know the, the stats, right? You spend a great deal of money to get maybe, I think it's around, what, one in 10,000 ad views that results in a click? One in every 10,000? Actually, uh, my favorite stat, my favorite advertising stat is uh, on mobile, uh, more than half of all advertising clicks are by accident. So let's make that one in 20,000 ad results, uh, ad views results in a click that was intended. It, it's, it's almost this inordinate, uh, unbelievable challenge of being signal instead of noise. And as marketers, a lot of the time, we are making noise, not signal. It's very hard, even for us, even for professionals who've been doing this for a long time, who have expertise to be able to know what is signal. Insane challenges. And this is our job, right? We have to take companies from invisible and campaigns from invisible to known and loved. Those immense marketing challenges, being signal rather than noise, that is what stands in our path. These are our great filters. 
And in fact, they're going to filter out almost every company, almost every campaign, almost every message, almost every marketer will be filtered out. How, how are we going to break through these? How are we going to get through the filters that hold back our messages from reaching the right audience? I think to do that, we have to be able to identify what those filters are in aggregate and then on a smaller level and understand and break through. This is what's going to make us successful. This is what will make us stand out. This is what can make us get through these insane filters. And so I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about six of marketing's great filters. And I'll give some tips and some of my experience from breaking through a few of these in a small way. And I want you to be able to apply this same logic to any of the campaigns, the projects, the companies, the clients that you serve. So the six I'm going to talk about are audience, message, cost, cost of customer acquisition specifically, serendipity, competitive advantage, and building a flywheel. So let's talk about the ability to reach the right audience. Uh, what I've very frequently seen is, um, and, and experienced myself, is that when we throw messages out, especially in inbound marketing channels, because it is not as uh, nearly as targeted or uh, that you're paying by the impression or by the click or by the acquisition, that it can be very tough to know who your audience is and know how to reach them. However, I got this email uh, a few months ago from Eric Bandholtz over at Beard Brand, who, as you might imagine, is one of my favorite human beings. Uh, and one of my favorite companies. I think I forgot to put mustache wax in today. Is it all bushy? It looks weird, doesn't it? You guys are staring at me right now, aren't you? Anyway, but it, Eric, Eric was just literal in sending out this, I would like a beard brand cloning survey. I, I actually, I think his email marketing, even if you have no interest in beards, you should sign up for their email marketing because every message they send, I read religiously. I want to make Moz's messaging sound more like beard brands. I think it's incredible. As you already know, you're pretty much the most awesome person in the world. You lie, but you flatter me. I totally recognize that. So we were trying to find some more people similar to you. I, you know what's great about it? Like, he's so tag fee with this. It's transparent, it's authentic, it's fun. And you take this beard brand cloning survey, which helps beard brand figure out who their audience is so that they can go target other people like you. Your customers actually will help you do this. One of the things that we do a lot in, in SEO and in, in search marketing of all kinds is that we bias our efforts onto the terms and phrases and, and just search topics broadly that are going to convert someone soon, right away. And that makes sense in paid. I, I get why that happens, right? That, there is some intelligence to that. I think your, your formula has got to add up there, otherwise you're spending poorly. But particularly in SEO, and maybe even in paid search, before someone searches, let's say you're, you're a bartender, right, which sells a, a bar inventorying app. You know, you, you got to stock your bar, and instead of writing down everything, you take a picture of all the bottles with your phone, and it'll actually calculate, you know, you have this much uh, bullet rye left and that's this much money, and that's, you know, that's this how much your bartenders gave out for free last night, de depending on that. And so before someone searches for a bar inventory app, they're searching for purchasing liquor for a bar and lots and lots of other things. If you can get in to someone's uh, uh, head, you can be in someone's path before they need your product, that's hugely valuable. This, is, this has been a great, great uh, system for us to say before anyone's ever interested in you know, $99 a month SEO software, they are first interested in learning about SEO and learning about social and like all these other things, all these other topics, and thus being there in advance. This is kind of the principle behind 
content marketing as a whole. Long before someone searches for this, they search for this. Even a small element of virality, in my opinion, is worth going after and worth repeated investment and testing even if you keep failing at it. This is uh, one of my favorite recent examples of, of virality. This company, Peach, which is a startup in Seattle, um, did a, uh, a, a great job with this. So they've, um, they started talking to office managers all around the city, including our own Hillary McCall from Moz. And uh, so Hillary sent out an email saying, hey, Peach is a fellow Seattle-based startup that delivers box lunches from some of the most popular restaurants in the area to busy professionals like us. Cool. And then you try, you try and sign up. Your location is still not activated because we don't have enough users. We'll activate your location when, you, when we reach 25 users. Ask your friends to sign up. And you know, like the Moz email thread, right, is basically like, come on, people. Get on there so we can get this. Nice. Nice little bit of reality there. Smart. What I like about elements of virality is if you, can, you can find even that one person who's passionate about your product, they can help it spread and get it in front of a lot of other people. It's finding that first evangelist or those first groups of evangelists that's really hard. Tip number four, when it comes to audience, early adoption is, it's like cheating. This, is, this was a great post on Google Plus from Mark Traphagen, uh, who's up at Stone Temple in Boston. So Mark wrote an LO user guide. Does, is anyone actually on LO yet? I have an account on there, but I haven't really used it. OK, like a handful of folks. So LO had this big sort of, we're the anti-Facebook, and, and um, became very popular over the last couple of weeks. I think they were getting, at one point, like 30,000 signups an hour, something like that. People were selling invites on eBay. The, the usual tech thing. And Mark noticed that after he wrote his LO user guide, which then was getting a tremendous amount of search traffic coming in, he looked and he actually owned the whole front page. Every single thing about LO guide or LO user guide was his work or someone referencing what he would built because he got there early. He got there first before everyone else. And he was empathetic enough to recognize the need that people would have. Really. Really, really smart. Timing plus the right content created complete domination. Second big filter, crafting a message that's actually going to resonate, that people will care enough about to listen to and amplify. And so one of, one of my first tips is that my, my best content, the, the content that's performed best for me across the web is always content that has resonated offline, in person, with people. When I tell stories on, on my blog, when I, when I write posts, when I do Whiteboard Fridays, whatever it is that, that I'm doing, if I haven't had a conversation with someone in person, and I've seen their eyes light up and them get excited about it, it that content tends not to perform well. And so if you're going to invest in messages, make sure they're messages that resonated in person. It can be really easy to stand in front of that, well, you guys probably sit, but I use a standing desk, so I have a bad back. And uh, I'll tell you, actually, I'm going to tell you a story about my bad back later. But <laughs> this, this is sharing time for all of us, uh, mostly me right now, but feel selfish. So uh, you stand, you're going to stand in front of your computer, and you're going to, you're going to be biased to create a lot of things that probably will not resonate. And if you had that conversation, you would find the nugget, the element that did. Well, almost everyone here, especially those of you with larger teams, are going to be doing some conversion rate optimization. right? You're going to be doing testing around the language that you use in your marketing messages, particularly, but weirdly exclusively, in your paid marketing messages. This is something that I have done poorly as well, right? We've done a ton of testing around our advertisements on Facebook and our messages on Twitter and our paid search ads and our email headlines. And then we learn what works and don't apply it to our inbound efforts or our content or the messages that we put on our website. It's like, it's like we were taking crazy pills and washing them down with crazy juice. Uh, if you know that a headline works better, 
go ahead and change that page title and maybe change the social too. And potentially you're going to draw more visits, more clicks, more amplification. You know it works. Consistency of message is very important, right? This is something they taught us all in, I don't know, Mad Men school? Did we go to that? I dropped out of college. I, I forget. But consistency of message, I absolutely agree. Very, very important. Consistency of format is super boring. And so when you have a message to tell, when I've had messages to tell, and I've told it once in one way, in one place, that has had a very small impact. When I've told it many times over many different mediums, that's had a great impact. So I, for example, right, I, uh, I started up a, um, a, a, a testing laboratory for SEO experiments. And uh, I apologize, I'm not, I'm not doing my like, SEO experiment presentation, but you can find it online. It's on my slideshare. And uh, did all these experiments. And I wrote about it on my blog. And I created a presentation that went on SlideShare. And I did a lot of tweeting and sharing, too. And I put it on, uh, I, I presented it in person at, uh, I think it was at MozCon this year. And uh, many, many mediums, consistency of message. Rand's running this thing called iMac Lab. It tests search and social uh, experiments. You should come join. Same message over and over, different formats. When it comes to great messages, we, we all have a pretty good eye for them. Like marketers I've, I've found are like, wow, that, that works, that resonates. Powerful messages are simple. This is from Yesware. And they've really boiled down the essence of what their software does. Like it's, it's sort of for salespeople, it's email tracking for salespeople to tell you like what happened with the email after send. Want to know what happens after you click send? It, totally resonates. It's simple. And in the simplicity, it tells the story of the brand and the product. Uh, this is, um, who is this, guys? Bounce.io, right? So Bounce.io, uh, which is a foundry company, actually, they have this great, you, got, you should visit their web page. I think it works on mobile. I can't remember if it does. But it's got this really slick thing. It shows like the laptop, right? And then it essentially shows a bounced message over here. And it, as you drag your uh, cursor across or your finger across, it'll show you what Bounce.io can replace that message with. So you know that you're getting you know, uh, some percent of your email is bouncing uh, to you or from you, depending on who you are. And so that bounced email gets ignored. Well, now you can see why that's happening. right? This bounce message, delivery, DKM signature, X Google, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it couldn't be delivered because John's inbox is full. Oh. Oh, what do you know? I'll send him a text. I like Posthaven, too. So Posthaven was kind of a response to all the blogging, blog hosting services that cropped up around the web and then would shut down. And you'd have to move your blog over and migrate it real quick and say, like, save all the files to your hard drive, put them in the cloud on AWS, and set up your own personal. Pain in butt. So Posthaven says their whole message is, websites come and go, but this one is made to last forever. Uh, I'll pr and I think this is kind of, uh, this is kind of cool. It especially appeal, appeal to like the Y Combinator Hacker News crowd. Our pledge to you will never get shut down, will never get acquired. You pay, we keep the lights on. All right. Simple messages resonate. And when it comes to messaging, it's very hard to promote yourself and company. But promoting a mission, a cause, that's much easier. Which is why Fitbit doesn't say a little thing that clips to your belt that you should buy and it costs this much money and it will track your fitness and you can compare it against your friends online. You, you can find out that information, but instead it says dedicated to helping you reach your fitness goals. My fitness goals, which as you can see are minimal at best, uh, are like, that's a cause, that's a mission. Cost, cost of customer acquisition. This kills, I think this kills more startups and more campaigns than many of these. I'm not sure any, but many, many of these. One of the things that I found, by the way, for a lot of companies is that they, they don't do this. They don't break out the cost of marketing from the cost of sales, right? So this is all marketing spend stuff. 
in a cost of customer acquisition. And then there's cost of sales stuff, right? The, the, the sales spend, the sales salaries, your sales travel and, uh, and expenses, right? Deal closing, whatever that takes. Your sales tech costs, Yesware, right? If you're using Yesware, they would go in here. If you're using something like uh, Bounce.io, that might go in here. If you don't break these out, and, and many, many companies don't, if you don't break them out, you won't understand in your cost of ac customer acquisition which one's broken and which one can be tuned up and fixed. And this is, that makes it really, really challenging to get to a good cost of customer acquisition. I also strongly recommend if you have a chance in a, in a new campaign you're working on, for a new project, for a startup, that you spend early and invest early in inbound. Because what I've discovered, and I, I bet many of you have as well, is that when it comes, when you get to uh, a company that, or a campaign that's already done a ton of paid media, the expectations around how long it takes to deliver results and around how things get done and who does them and on the power of creative versus the power of tweaking and tuning, it's almost like the, the philosophy is baked in before you got there and thus you can't change those minds. And changing this process is insanely hard. So my recommendation is to start here because it's actually pretty easy to get involved in this stuff. Uh, later, right, to get involved in, in, in the paid marketing side later on. This is another big mistake folks make, is they, they, look at, uh, they look at their acquisition channels and they measure them by conversions, which I, I would not say don't do that. You should know it. You should also know assisted conversions, of course, right? Mo almost all of us are now sophisticated enough to do multi-channel and multi-touch tracking, good. But do you know the lifetime value of someone who had an assist through social versus those who didn't? If you don't know lifetime value, you could be investing in marketing that brings you high converting, poor quality customers, right? Customers who are one and done. Ugh. This is nightmarish for SaaS businesses, but it's getting worse and worse for e-commerce businesses as e-commerce businesses are getting uh, more sophisticated and more valued based on lifetime value uh, and, and recidivism. If it's at all possible, by the way, in your acquisition process, in your funnel, try and do something. Uh, actually, let me check. How many of you have like a sales process that includes uh, uh, real sales people at some point? Real sales people at some point. Maybe. 20% of the crowd looks like, 25%. So for those of you who do this, it, I, I've talked to a ton of companies that have this issue. They basically want to pre-qualify everyone through their sales team. And they're scared of doing free trials because they've seen lots of data, and I've seen it too, that say basically you know, the people who take this free trial oftentimes are not uh, right looking, are, are not as good customers as the ones that are pre-qualified by the sales team. Okay, I, I give you that, but, but, you can scale this so much easier than you can scale sales, and you can actually bring, bring down your cost of customer acquisition if you use this, and then you just have to pay attention to how people use the product and get your salespeople in front of the ones who are what I'd call right-looking customers, right? That looks like someone who uses the product or evangelizes or does something that makes them look like a, a high-quality, high-lifetime-value customer. Now we're going to put them in front of a salesperson. This can scale without forcing your sales team to do the pre-qualification. That is beautiful. Serendipity. It's like my favorite picture in the deck. I love this. Uh, so one of the things that you have to do to be successful with serendipity, and, and by the way, when, when I talk about why serendipity is such a great filter, it's because whenever I talk to um, CEOs and CMOs and, and marketers and technologists and entrepreneurs of all kinds, and we talk about like the great successes they've had, there's a huge element of luck a huge element of luck, right? They're, they're like, well, and then I happened to be on a plane next to this guy from Google and 
right? I was at this conference, I met this person, they later introduced me to someone, I ran a webinar for them, and then on that webinar there was someone who listened in who invited me to speak at this other conference, and while I was there I met this person who acquired my company. And can we track that back? No. It's purely serendipitous. And in order to be good at serendipity, you have to do things that, for me, you, you guys probably don't know this, well some of you might, is that I'm, I'm actually an introvert, right? So after and before this session, like I, I need a bunch of alone time, I, like I wanna hang out with all of you, and I will all, all today, but then I will go back to my hotel room and be like, alone, need to be alone, right? And so you, there's like this forcing function where you have to do all of these things in order to extend the vectors of exposure that you have. I, I like to call serendipity, it is created by things you don't have time for. That is how serendipity happens. It happens when you do the things that you don't have time to do. I am not actually a big fan, and I, 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 I rarely will say this, right, that you should only do what you love. I think you can grow to love to do things, and I think that loving to do something and being great at it can go together, but not always. What I, can, what I will say with some certainty is things that you hate to do, those things almost certainly will not bring you serendipity. That, that's why the Batman is not showing up, because that guy hates his job. If you hate it, not bringing any serendipity. You have to know something before you interact with people. If you do, you don't have to, but if, if you do, if I know something about Christian when he's emailing me, I can create far more serendipity than if I have to go research him, which I, I just don't have time because there's too much email, 100 billion of them a day. Not all to me, thank God. Uh, feels like it. The, but this, full contact, sits in my sidebar and so like I can, ah, that's slick and there's his latest tweets and this enables a ton of the serendipity that I can do over email. I love it. Uh, I want to tell you a story about, about Posi and some, some recent serendipity that I experienced. Um, you know, because it includes a, um, a bag filled with marijuana and a bunch of software engineering referrals. Uh, but I don't have time. And so I tell you what, during the Q&A, if you're like, hey, what was that story you were going to tell? Then you can ask if you're interested or grab me after. You do need to find a competitive advantage. Absolutely critical to being successful in marketing, to breaking through filters, is finding something that you are nearly best of the world at, or at least better than all your competition at. That, that competitive advantage, that also, often does come from that intersect between things you love and things that you have to do for work. I stole this uh, slide from, from my wife, Geraldine, who, uh, who gave a presentation about blogging. One of the things I hate, I hate this. I see this attitude pervading all of the SEO world for the last 15 years. People look at the top result, or couple results, and they go, I could do that better. And then they do it, and they think, now I deserve to rank. But that's not actually true. If you make a taxi cab company where you say, hey, look, we will clean out the back seat after every customer so like, you don't have to sit in gum. That's better than taxi cabs. That is not Uber. And therefore, it will get no traction and no success. And the same is pretty much true in marketing and specifically in SEO. The question I want you to ask instead is, can we do something that's 10 times better than anything on this page? It, this is your bar. This is the litmus test. Not, oh, you can do better, something better than that. I want to urge you not to get bogged down by your weaknesses, right? So these, these are kind of Moz's historic strengths, like pretty good at, co at content, community, social, SEO. Our weaknesses, on the other hand, well, like LinkedIn, I, we're not very good at LinkedIn, really. Trade show booths, like we were, 
Offlat, we only tried it for a few years, didn't get, really get there. Same with affiliate, we, we didn't have great success there. I think we have a lot of work to do on our, our email, getting better, PPC, that kind of stuff. But you can get really bogged down in this stuff, and especially early on in a campaign or with a company, spending time getting up to speed on these and getting better at the things that you kind of suck at is actually a net negative. My, my fourth tip is actually don't get complacent about these strengths either. If you hit cruise control on those, you're gonna be losing out hugely, right? If, if we kind of go, hey, we're really good at community, we don't, we don't have to invest there. No, that's, that's gonna suck. Will is not gonna stand up here and tell you how awesome it is that Moz Q&A is all answered within a few hours if we hit cruise control. Flywheel. The flywheel has to scale without friction. I think, uh, actually, there's been some talks already here uh, about flywheel. Uh, I'll show you one flywheel. Like, this is the classic content marketing SEO flywheel. But this can be applied to lots of forms of marketing, right? Brand marketing, advertising, paid search can be applied in lots of ways. But here you go. You hit publish. You amplify that content, right? You share it. You uh, grow your network when you amplify, hopefully, right? If your message is interesting, a few more people amplify it for you, and a few more people start following you, and now your network's a little bigger. And then you hopefully are getting some links or other types of signals that potentially can help that content uh, reach bigger audiences, as well as grow your authority so that you can rank higher for all sorts of stuff on your domain, not just the one thing you just published. Right now you can rank for, for slightly more competitive terms and phrases. And, and then from there you can earn some nice search traffic and hopefully that search traffic gets a little bit of amplification and network growth and links for you. And you go back and you start the flywheel again. This is a good flywheel. I think this is why content marketing is so huge right now. It's because this is a really good flywheel and it can scale without friction if you get it up and running. But if you anticipate that, the <laughs> that your traffic graph is gonna look like this, right? That in, what, uh, six months, seven months, that you're gonna go from nobody to a hero? It, you are doomed. Doomed. I like how that sounds on the microphone. Doomed. Just gonna come up here and entertain myself later. Uh, if, however, you anticipate that the first few revolutions are gonna take an inordinate amount of effort, years of effort, this is gonna be much more realistic. This is how almost all of the successful content marketing that I've ever seen, including Mint, OK Trends, the Moz blog, we, we all had this. Years of not a whole lot going on followed by, oh my gosh, it suddenly looks like overnight we were good at it. Nope. It's those years of sucking that made us good, good enough in these final years. When you have a flywheel, you have to relentlessly search for your flywheel's friction, right? So if you can identify the fact that like, what's broken in the flywheel is, hey, wait a minute, our social efforts are never growing our audience. Like we do sharing, but it, it doesn't seem to get higher engagement, it doesn't grow our follower count, no one amplifies. That's our point of friction. If you find that point of friction, now you can do something about it. Once that flywheel's moving, by the way, you should be taking any additional force that you can and leveraging it to push on it. So a great example in the, in the uh, SEO and content marketing worlds is retargeting, right? This is essentially an additional force that you can leverage to move that flywheel faster, to push on it more. I, I, and I love it. So when, circling back to the Fermi paradox, we, uh, we actually glossed over one of the possibilities. I glossed over. It, it turns out maybe there could be a type three civilization, but they are not the friendly kind. Think uh, Klingons, not Vulcans, for the Star Trek, or whatever Greedo was. What was Greedo in Star Wars? They probably gave him a name. 
right? So like species origin, there's, there's a type three civilization out there in the Milky Way. They do not want to be perceived by us. And should we get to some point in our future, they'll be like, oh, it's, I'm sorry. Did you just try and colonize another planet? We're going to have to take care of that. Um, you might say, well, this, this sounds a little far-fetched and sci-fi and ridiculous. This actually, Carl Sagan believed that this was such a likely possibility that uh, when he was talking, he actually uh, talked to the folks at SETI and, and METI, right, the, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, and, and he said, messaging extraterrestrials is deeply unwise. Like, I don't think we should do this. We don't, we don't particularly know uh, how they might react and respond. And the weird, the weird part about this is, in our world, what's kind of strange about marketing is that 800-pound gorilla companies, right, like those competitors, they don't actually appear to be the great filters for us. In fact, when companies talk about why they fail or when I talk to folks more ad hoc about what went wrong in their marketing, it's almost never the case that a competitor went into you know, channel or flywheel where you were having success and ate that, uh, uh, took that channel away from you, took that flywheel away from you. That doesn't happen. Sometimes you get outcompeted on product. Sometimes you get outcompeted on engineering. Sometimes you might occasionally get outcompeted on cost of customer acquisition. I see that one a little bit. But one of the weird paradoxes of great marketing is that, particularly through inbound channels, is that it's rarely contested and I think that's because you can, if you follow Moz on Twitter, it's okay to also follow Majestic SEO or uh, Serps.com or GetStat or whomever. It, the attention isn't purely I get it or you don't. Same sort of true with search results. And thus, we have this paradox where building a competitive advantage in marketing it's actually a competitive advantage for companies. I think that's why we're seeing the emergence of CMOs owning so much more of the budget and being the path to the chief executive office. I find that trend fascinating. I'm surprised it didn't exist before now. I'm very bullied that it does. But I think this is exciting, that marketing, that we can be the barrier to entry and the competitive advantage for our companies. And if you sell marketing like that, I think your budgets can grow dramatically. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Looking forward to the Q&A.